Uh, physical Bible. Physical Bible, everybody. Physical Bible, Jonah. Jonah, get a Bible. Put a Bible in his hand. Do me a favor. There you go. All right. All right. Sweet. A Bible has been put in our hand. Great. Okay. I want to ask you a very serious question. Of all the questions I'll ask, this is the most serious. How many dog lovers do we have in the room? Dog lovers? Mr. Tutu? Okay. All right, I want three people. What kind of dog do you have? Connor, what kind of dog do you have? What kind of dog do you have? Okay. Okay, that, that's all. That's all, Connor. Brady? Bulldog. Cool. Awesome. All right. Evelyn? What kind of dog do you have? Okay. All right, Julia, and that's it. Golden Doodle? Okay, one more, and we're done. Yeah, Luke. Okay. No. <laughs> okay. So, I love dogs, but I didn't have any dogs growing up. I had a dog for three days, but I kept running away twice. That's a long story for another day. But, guess what? I've got, yeah, we are getting a dog, and the picture should be up here. Should be on a slide. Well, that is the dog we're getting as of 1 p.m. today. We put the deposit down. That's our dog. He lives now in Ohio for the next few days until we go pick it up. All right. We don't know a name, so if you could help us, that'd be great. Um, but I've been excited for this new dog, Blank. I'll call him Blank. Blank. I'm so excited to get Blank. Um, he's. It's so exciting. But I never had a dog of my own, so I don't know what it takes to have a dog until I talked with my brother a few days ago. So me, me and Elijah. We have a really close relationship. We call each other almost every day, every other day. We FaceTime all the time. And uh, I told him about us maybe getting a dog. And my brother, he had puppies for a little bit. And he was like, do you know how much work that's going to be? How much, excuse my language, pee and poop it will it'll do on the floor no matter what? And I'm like, what? It's uh, well, apparently, this is going to be an eight-week-old dog. And so it's going to pee and poop everywhere. And, so, and that's the change that's going to happen. It's going to be hard. All right? And I feel like for some of us, new things, new things that we experience, we don't expect the hard things to happen. Right? Like, I didn't expect a puppy to be that much work. My brother said, yo, it's going to be a ton of work. You're going to have to clean out the pee and the poop all the time. I'm like, oh, man. And Faith is like, don't tell him that. Don't tell him that. <laughs> it's really funny. Um, but yeah, that's what we're talking about today. Change is great, but that doesn't mean it's always easy. Um, so here's the truth. Most of us think that new means easier. New means easier. Oh, maybe if I'll get to middle school, my life will be easier. Oh, maybe when I get a dog, <laughs> life will be easier. Maybe if I get to high school, life will be easier. No, like if you're struggling with a teacher or a coach, you think maybe if you had a new one, it'll be better. Or maybe if you got drama with your friends. I'm not talking about, like, doing plays. I'm like, drama, drama. Like, there's tea in the room, okay? I don't know if you know what tea is. Tea? Tea, tea. spill the tea. It's like drama, okay? Not good things. But you start imagining what a new friend group might be like because there's a lot of drama going on. It's normal to think that way because we believe that something that's automatically new is going to make our lives automatically better. But here's the catch. Even when we get something new, it still comes with change. And change is difficult. Change is hard. In fact, stepping into something new requires some of our most effort. All right? So m let me give you an example. Maybe you finally got that class or team that you've always wanted. It's awesome. But then you realize it's a whole lot tougher than expected. Or maybe you started a new friendship. But after a while, you notice all the same conflicts you had with your old friends, right? We've all been there. It's easy to think that change will fix everything. Oh, it's like the best new iPhone. It's going to be great. Or the best new this. No, it's the same thing, all right? <laughs> all right? Uh, it's the same, right? Everything, right? But, some, but most of the times, we realize that not change is hard because life is hard. Life is difficult, all right? 
And so that's where we're going to go to. We're going to see what Paul says to a church in Corinth about this. Okay, so if you have your Bibles, raise them up. Thank you. Okay. All right. All right, we're going to do a sword drill. Okay. Okay, lightsabers are not allowed. That means your phone Bible. No phone Bibles. All right, your sword, because Ephesians 6 calls Scripture the sword of the spirit. That's the sword drill. You have to hold it by the spine. No cheating, okay? Hold it by the spine straight up. By the spine. Everyone, by the spine. Lucian, put your hand up. Put your hand up, dude. Okay. All right, 2 Corinthians 5.17, go. Once you get it, stand up and read. Second Corinthians five seventeen. Once you get it, you stand up and read, and you get bragging rights for eternity with capital E. Okay, uh, Aubrey was the first one to stand up and read. All right, everyone, sit down. Everyone, sit down. Okay. All right, everyone. Get to the passage. Listen to Aubrey read it. This has everything to do with change. Okay? All right, go. Yes. Thank you. All right. That, that has a lot to do with change. But do you know what helps us when you read a verse? Have you ever got those, like, Bible verse of the day on your notifications? What helps us is to read what's around it, the context, Right? Right, who is writing? And that guy, his name is Paul. Paul is writing this letter to the church in Corinth. All right? And this church, right, this family, like, like the church family here at Walloon, imagine them not having a big building because they didn't have big buildings back then. And they were meeting in each other's houses. That's kind of how the church interacted. And Paul's main goal was to defend his authority as an apostle because uh, he used to, Paul used to kill Christians when he was Saul. And Paul is saying, yo, Jesus is speaking to me, and you need to hear this. Also, encourage reconciliation among believers. So there's, there's big divisions, right? Remember, like, the tea I was saying, right, the drama? There was big drama coming on the Corinth church. Why? Because life is hard. Change is hard. And as, you, as, you, as time passes, there's more change. And I bet the Corinth church was going through a lot of change. But really, Paul's main point is this. To emphasize the power of the gospel and how that brings people together and brings people to Jesus. Everyone say, brings people together and brings people to Jesus. Yeah, that's what, that's his whole point, all right? And 2 Corinthians 5, even in the chapter, how it starts, it's so good, okay? So everyone go to 2 Corinthians 5, verse 1. Follow along after me. For we know that when this earthly tent we live is in is in, we, I messed this up in the high school too. This earthly tent we live in is taken down. That is, when we die and leave this earthly body, we will have a house in heaven, an eternal body made for us by God himself, not by human hands. We grow weary in our present bodies. And we long to put our heavenly bodies like new clothing. So Paul is saying this. You have earthly bodies right now, and they are imperfect. They are not, they, they're not eternal. What is eternal, when you, reach, when you reach eternity, that means things are never going to change, right? We're talking about change. In eternity, things will never change because you're of God who is perfect and eternal, and you are perfected with him, okay? And that's what it's saying. Just like a tent. Ever been camping? Does a tent stay there forever? Everyone say, no. no. Wh- whisper it, no. No, right? No, no, it, do, it doesn't stay there forever, right? So and then we hop to the passage around it. Follow me. Either way, Christ's love controls us. We also believe that we all have all died to our old life. He died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ, who died and was raised for them. So we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. And at one time, we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view. How differently we know him now. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. A new person. The old life is gone, and the new life has begun. That's a huge promise. That Christ, his death and resurrection, was so that you can die to your old life 
and to live a new life. But will you live the perfect life? Are you going to live a perfect life, the new life Christ has given you? Are you? No, 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 right? Because we are imperfect. Our earthly bodies are imperfect. But what was perfect, though, what was perfect, though, was that Christ, right, verse 15, he died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. He said they would live for Christ, who has died and was raised for them. Christ was perfect. And because of Christ's sacrifice, he put his, he put his um, perfectedness into us. So that when we get to eternity, when we get to Jesus, where he judges us, he sees, God sees his son Jesus in us. Because Jesus is perfect. And that the guilt that we, has been charged against us, right? It's like a warrant for our arrest. Christ put his name on that warrant instead of you. And that death was arrested, right? Remember that song? That's a good song, right? And because of that, it won't be perfect. Change is still hard. But Christ has started a new life that has begun. People look, overlook this all the time. We often look at, overlook it. Begun. Paul doesn't say our new life is completed. No, just like in the beginning of the passage, chapter 5. It's like our earthly bodies won't last long. No, a new life has begun. It's just the beginning. That means we are becoming new. It's a process. It's a process, and that process takes time. And Paul was reminded, was reminding the church in Corinth, he reminds us now that stepping into our new life with Jesus doesn't mean everything changes instantly. No, it, no, it's about trusting that God through the process of a change. And while that change can be hard, it's good. It's really good. All right? Because God works all things according to, to his purposes. For what? For your good. Exactly. He works all things for your good, despite all the hard things and the hard changes in life. Because he is sovereign. What does that mean? He's overall. He's exalted overall, but also he's personal with us. That our old life has gone away and the new life has begun. What does that mean? It's that personal relationship with him. Right? So what does this mean for you? Maybe some of you, like you, need a fresh start. Maybe you've been praying for God to change something in your life. Maybe it's a, it's a bad habit that you won't tell any of your friends or your, or your parents. Or a difficult relationship with somebody. Or even the way you see yourself. When you see yourself in the mirror, what do you think of? Is it all negative? Or is it the way that Jesus sees you? How does Jesus see you? And what is told throughout Scripture is that you are forgiven, you are accepted, and you are loved. You have to see yourself the way Jesus sees you. That's the only way you're going to make it through change. Whether in middle, when you get to middle school or you get to high school, right? You experience new teachers and new, new classes, new friends. That will change a lot in middle school because you're, you're trying to find yourself. Hey, who am I? Who am I? When you question that, when you go through change, remember, you have to come to Jesus and see, see yourself as how Jesus sees you, that you're loved, you're forgiven, you're accepted by him. And here's the thing. Just like Paul says, change takes time. New life, verse 15, 17 New life has begun. It's a beginning. It's a starting point. That's why Paul, throughout a lot of his letters, talks about running a race from the beginning to end. It's about running a, the race that Christ has laid before us. Are you at the, when you start your relationship with Jesus, are you already at the end zone? No. No, you're not. Right? Or when you plant a tree in the ground, does it become like a big oak tree overnight? No. Some of us... Yeah, here's the thing. We have to love the change. We have to love the process of becoming, of becoming new, of becoming a person who follows Jesus and loves like him more. Some of us just wants the benefit of what you get in eternal life. Someone just wants the benefit of fire insurance. You don't want to be separated from God forever, so you want to be in eternity, right? And some of you, 
have been told that by your parents, hey, right? Or the only reason why you're Christian is because you want to get to heaven. Yes, that, that is a desire that we should want, but we should love the person that loves us back, who, died, who put his life on the line and died for you. Right? We should, we should love him back because how much he loves us. And it wants to be personal with you. It, and it's not, it's not about what we get from Jesus. It's how we know who Jesus is and how he's working in us. Because the new life has begun. Eternal life, yes, we will die one day physically, but eternal life starts now. A new life has begun. And we're going to be with Jesus now and for eternity forever. But it's not going to be perfect yet. Right? We still have to experience change. Where in your life is God asking you to trust the process of becoming new? Is it in your relationships, your family, at, your family or your school? Is it how you view yourself? Remember, new equals change, and change isn't always easy, but it's good. All right, so, so next time you get a really hard math test, you're like, oh, I don't want to do it. I just want to play Fortnite, or I want to go on my Switch, or, or, um, or I just want to go, I don't know, what do sixth grade girls do? What do you like to do? I'm going to let them speak because they know how to, what? Play outside. Oh, I want to be outside. I did that a lot in school. I saw people playing outside in recess. I'm like, man, I want to go outside. All right? No. Pay attention in class and realize this is an opportunity to learn and to change. And also, school is an opportunity to show others who Christ is, who Jesus is. That's, that's, it's also another opportunity, too. All right? So what can we do? Let's start by looking through, looking through a new lens. All right. Has anyone ever tried to like put on someone else's eyeglasses? Does that is it blurry sometimes? Right. Yeah. Right. Sometimes we put on glasses that don't belong to us. They belong to the enemy that wants us to see ourselves in a blurry way. They want to see, the enemy wants to see us as we're guilty, we're, we're ashamed, we're, we're, lo- we're lonely, we're all these things that are so negative. But no, no, Jesus wants to give you the glasses that belong to you, which is really his. So, so what does that mean? See yourself the way Jesus sees you, that you're loved, you're accepted, you are forgiven. All right, so see that. And also, take one step forward every day. Change doesn't happen overnight. Remember, verse 17, the old life is gone, is gone, definite. The new life has begun. It's a process, all right? So maybe that's a step reaching out to someone that you're struggling with. Hey, I'm struggling with this. I need your help. Maybe it's forgiving someone. Maybe you're holding unforgiveness from someone because of what they've done to you. No, see them as Christ does. See yourself as Christ does. If that God has forgiven so much in us, we should forgive the others who hurt us. Because that's how imaginable Christ's love is. It's not just for you, but it's also the person that you don't like. Man, that's amazing. All right? maybe, it's, maybe it's showing someone kindness that doesn't deserve it. Maybe someone's been like kicking your chair in class. Or someone broke your pencil looked at you in your eyes and went, right? How would you feel? (laughs) Pretty bad, right? But (laughs) it's about showing kindness, all right? It's about showing kindness even when someone looks in your eyes and breaks your pencil, all right? And say, hey, it's okay, I'll get a new one. Please don't do that again. But Christ loves you, (laughs) you know? But actions are so much louder than words, right? And uh, so whatever it is, take that next step. Take that next step, because change is hard. But Christ took this and put it on himself, and that he gave us eternal life. He gave us a, new, a possible new life, that even when life is hard, we have Jesus to trust in. Just like this, uh, the hymn I love, how sweet it is to trust in Jesus. And let that sweetness be new every morning. So 
Let's pray, and then let's go to life groups and talk more about this. God, how sweet it is to love you and to trust in you. When change is hard, God, we recognize that it, life is always going to change. It's never going to stop. And help this to be opportunities to step into the new life that has begun within us when we first has accept, when we first um, followed you for the rest of our lives, when we were saved by you, by the gospel of Jesus, Jesus' death and resurrection, that he paid the penalty for our sin, he rose to life to give us new life. Help us to remember the gospel and how sweet it is to know you, Jesus. And I, I pray that life groups be fruitful and plentiful and that we will open up about things that we might have never opened up about. Uh, I pray that your Holy Spirit will move. Amen.